So, I do not consider myself to be a perfect parent. Can anybody relate? There are days that I don't consider myself to even be a good parent. Um, there's this one time in particular that vividly stands out in my mind where I failed miserably as a parent, and it is the time that I lost my child. Yep, I lost her. Um, I lost her so good that I didn't even know I lost her. Well, let me explain. Let me explain. We were at the mall shopping. I was a new parent. I was new to this thing. And I was shopping the sales racks. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. When you're shopping the sales rack. And uh, it was one of those circular style uh, clothing racks, and she decided to go hide inside of it. Like many kids do that age, they make a fort out of the circular clothing rack. Anybody did that before? All right, so don't hate on me too much. She's in there hiding, and because I'm new to parenting, I didn't find what I was looking for on that clearance rack, and I went ahead and moved on to the next section of the store, forgetting that I had a child hiding somewhere. It was not until I heard over the loudspeaker, will the parents of Caitlin McKelvey please come to the customer service support desk? I was mortified. Yeah! <laughs> That's my kid! The only thing more mortifying than hearing your own name on the loudspeaker at the mall is hearing them say, well, the parents of and your child's name because now everybody in the store knows you're a horrible parent. <laughs> they know you're horrible and that you lost your kid. And so I ran as fast as I could to that customer support desk and there my daughter was hysterically crying, one of those you left me kind of moments, right? She had experienced the full anxiety of being left, of being lost. I can still remember all of the emotions. I felt mostly embarrassed, but on the other side, my child is now with a stranger because I forgot about them. And I know for a fact because we spoke about it, I got her permission to tell the story that she can still remember the feelings and the emotions of being lost. If you've ever been lost like that before, or even worse, there's this one thought that's going through your mind, this one major emotion, and it's this question, is there anyone looking for me? Is there anyone looking for me? Who is looking for me. If you're a single person in here today, been trying to find Mr. or Mrs. Right, maybe you've come to a point in your life where you're asking kind of that question, who's looking for me? Who's looking for me? Who can deal with all this business? <laughs> right? Is there anybody looking for me? For all the other parts of this series, We've been talking about what we're looking for, what we want out of life, what we want from God. We're seeking happiness, we're seeking joy, we're seeking prosperity, we're seeking healing. But today, I want to talk about what God's looking for. What's God seeking? And in the book of Luke, Luke is in the first part of the New Testament. It's in the Gospels. Jesus is alive. He's discipling his people. He's speaking and he says this. For the Son of Man, in Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man came to this earth to seek and to save those who were lost. The Son of Man came to this world to seek and to save those who were lost. So it was a two-part mission. If he just came here to seek and not save, he would have failed. If he would have came and just saved without first seeking, he would have failed. It was a two-parter. Seek and to save those who are lost. And, and, and this is in spite of 
knowing if you're lost or not. You see, my daughter didn't know that she was lost. She was fine in her hideout until she came out looking. Then there was this reality, oh my gosh, where's my family? I'm lost. So Jesus came to look for both kinds. Those who knew they were lost in need of a Savior and those also who thought they had it all together. He had to point out to them, you can't do this without me. So today we're going to look at two very popular parables, two very popular stories in the Bible. And everybody in here today who knows these two stories is going to be challenged by the fact that you think you know what you're talking about. You think you already know this story. There's always this challenge to shut the speaker off because you already know what I'm going to say in reading these two stories. But today, I challenge you to listen to what I'm going to teach today with a completely open mind and different lenses than maybe you've been taught and raised before, okay? The first of the two parables is very popular right now. It's being used by several groups of people to talk about uh, the situations that they find themselves in. And it's called the parable of the one who wandered off, or the lost sheep, or would Jesus leave the 99 and go after the one? Okay, and that's in Matthew 18, verse 12. And it says this. It says, what do you think? What 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 do you think? He's teaching. Well, what do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders off, will he not leave the 99 on the hill and go after the one? Uh, maybe not. I mean, if you're asking me my opinion, I still got 99. I still got 99. That's still very good odds. He's saying, he's asking us, well, what do you think? Should I leave 99 and go after one of them? He says, And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he's happier about the one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your heavenly Father is not willing that any one of these little ones should perish. Perish. Firstly, let's look at this. We have to understand that all creation belongs to the Lord. All creation belongs to God. Okay? The Bible says that if my people won't praise him, even the rocks and the trees will cry out. That all of creation will testify and worship to the glory of God. So when he's talking about the 99, he's talking about all of humanity. All of humanity is God's, the Lord's, even if they don't acknowledge him. Even if they don't acknowledge him. Come on, listen. You've got you to hear me out here, okay? The 100 sheep all belong to God. And then you got this one little knucklehead. you got this knucklehead who, he's got it all, man. He, he has access to God if he wants access to God. He, he can be fed by the goodness of God if he wants to. But this little knucklehead sheep is like, well, the grass looks greener on that hill. I can do this on my own. I don't need organized religion. I don't need the institution of Christianity. I don't need a master. I don't need a savior. I'm good. I'm going to do me right now. That's his knucklehead sheep. And so he leaves what he may be hearing. See, he was, he was part of the group. He was part of the popular kids, and he was with the crowd for a while. But there's one word in here that, that, that tells us this young sheep's condition, and it's this word, perish. He says, God is not willing that any shall perish. Now listen, 
this indicates to us that this sheep that wandered off was not a Christian, was not saved. Because those who are saved and sealed with a promise of the Holy Spirit, they can't perish. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him should not perish. But what does a Christian have? Everlasting life. So then we have to ask ourselves this question. Why would he leave 99 and go after the one? He would only leave a group of people that he knew were sealed, safe, and secure with a promise. God would never leave someone without hope. He would have never have left a group without hope. So that's why it cannot be used to, 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 to be manipulated into talking about different kinds of groups of people. It's talking about the saved and the lost. He would leave the saved in their throne, in their place, in their protected pasture to go after one that was on their way to perish. We have to look at this in the life of Jesus. He says, I cannot go to my father yet. You guys still, you still not work getting this. He says to his disciples, you're still not getting it. I can't ascend to heaven. You have no faith. It wasn't until he came back to his disciples, laid down the la last lesson. He goes, okay, you guys got it. Now I must go to the father. But I will not leave you until you're ready for me to go. That's the only way you can use this passage of Jesus or the shepherd leaving the 99 and going after the one. It's because they are so safe. They are so secure, high up on that hill where nothing can touch them. That he says, okay, you're cared for. Let me go get this one. We get it? But then there's this other story in the Bible. So popular, if not more popular, that stands in contrast to this story. And it's the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son. And oh, have I heard the story of the prodigal son taught. Oh man, I can make us all feel like we're all going to hell with the prodigal son story. Seriously, like we could preach the tar out of this thing. And I've been taught this story so many times in my life that like, Literally, I thought I was the prodigal son every other week. <laughs> I felt like when I left church on Sunday and then I went back to high school, I was the prodigal son that had to come home every Sunday. <laughs> but let's look at this story for a moment because I have some problems with the story. It's in Luke chapter 15 and Jesus is teaching once again. It says, Jesus continues, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Give me my inheritance. Give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. First of all, I got to ask, why'd you do it? If you knew what he was going to go do, why'd you give him his money now? Like, why'd you allow him to leave? Anyway, we'll get there. Verse 13, not long after the young son got together all he had and set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. I don't know what kind of partying he was doing, but he was partying, like big time. You don't squander all your inheritance. You know, it wasn't 10 bucks. It wasn't 10 bucks. This dude was rich. You don't squander all your inheritance with like, boring party. All right, they were drinking some top shelf. They were going in, all right? And then after he had spent everything, COVID-19 happened. <laughs> after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine and the whole country went bankrupt. They began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. 
from the palace to the pig pen. He longed to fill his stomach with pig food, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how my father, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? Let's just pause there for a minute. This was not a horrible father. This was not a horrible leader. This was not a horrible boss. He actually was making sure that his servants not only had food, but had food to spare. They actually were all living pretty well. How my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against you in heaven. What's he doing? He's rehearsing his repentance. He's writing a story. Come on, somebody. Act like you ain't never did that before. All right, let me give you a tip. Teenagers, let me give you a tip. You ever out there doing something your parents told you not to do and they catch you? Start crying. Just start crying. Just start straight out. Just start. All right, let me tell you a story. One time, (laughs) Dad, if you're watching, turn me off for like 35 seconds and then turn it back on. (laughs) There's one time my dad told me, don't go out. It, It was snowing. Don't go out with your friends tonight. But I already had plans. I already had plans with my boys. This is before cell phones were in existence or you could afford them. Um, so I didn't really have a way to get a hold of everybody and cancel the plan. So my dad turned on golf. And what happens if you turn on golf? You're going to fall asleep. So my dad took a nap. And as soon as he fell asleep, I hopped in my car. I went out to go hang out with my boys. And... Uh, I had a rear-wheel drive car. At the time, I got about two and a half miles away from the house. I hit some snow, lost control of the car, hit a tree, totaled my car. Totaled it. Brand new. Had 6,000 miles on the car. So, uh, (laughs) cops show up, and uh, the cops call my parents and tell them what happened. Wakes my dad up, so he has to come get me. And I was fine, like no bumps, no bruises, nothing, like the airba- airbags popped and all that, like I was safe. And so my dad, I see my dad pull up behind the cop car, and I was like, I'm hurt, my chest hurts, I can't breathe. You got to cry, man, you got to cry. Does something, triggers an emotion in your parents. Oh, my baby, you okay, right? So he's rehearsing. He's rehearsing his repentance. Come on, act like you ain't never did that before. Rehearse your repentance before God. Huh? I'll say to him, I've sinned against you, I've sinned against heaven, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Verse 20, so he got up and went to his dad. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son. He threw his arms around him and kissed him. He says, my son. Oh, no, I'm sorry. The son says, father. He rehearsed it. Oh, dad. I have sinned against you and I've sinned against heaven. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father The father said, this is Quick. Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his fingers and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. All right. Does this story sound similar to the last story? It does, but there's one major problem. There's a major, major problem with this story. The dad never went to go look for the son. He never left the house. He didn't go down to Front Street looking in the clubs for his son. He didn't look in the the back alleyways to see if his son was eating out of a dumpster. He didn't go down to the pig pen to go find him. He didn't go looking for his son. 
I thought he would leave the 99 and go after the one. So I got a problem with the story. I need to have a revelation of the story. What, God, what are you showing me? And there's a difference in this, the first sentence. Ready? There was a father who had two sons. They were sons. They were sons. They weren't sheep. They, they, they weren't a possession. They were a son. They were already part of the 99. They, they already had a position of sonship. Although the son chose to change his condition, the position of sonship never changed. They were sons. But one of those sons decided to do what the church world calls backslide. I mean, what a, what a term, right? Backslide. Backslider. Yeah, backslider. Ah, repent. Backslide. Do you know the word backslider can only be used for a Christian who already committed life to Christ? So whether you're backsliding or front sliding, you're going to be sliding all over the place your whole Christian walk. You're going to, you, listen, unless you read your Bible for another hour and a half every single day, you're going to backslide this week. Because you're not going to be where you are at this exact moment. Unless you therefore choose to read more of the word and then you're going to front slide. But either way, if Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior of your life, you are a son of the Most High God. And your position in Him is secure. Here's, here's the deal. His son wasn't lost. His son decided to walk away. His son decided to go do bad behavior. And before we get on his case, like his older brother, we have to realize that any one of us that has a problem with Christians who backslide, you are the older brother. You are the older brother. Sorry, go ahead. You can read the rest of the story. We're not going to get into it today. But... Where was I going with that? I don't know. I don't know. He decided to backslide, to, to, to perform bad behavior that he knew was not in alignment to the lifestyle that his father would have chose for him, but he was still a son. This is where, this is where, your older teachings or maybe even your current teachings from whatever you've heard is going to conflict. Is that, well, if he left home and he walked away and he did bad behavior, he's no longer a son. I got a problem with that. I got a problem with that. Because I've done a lot of bad behavior and I never stopped being the son of Joe McKelvey. I've had arguments with my dad where we were yelling at each other's face and I disrespected him and I did not stop being his son. He was upset at me and I was upset at him, but I didn't stop being a son. But there is a consequence. There, there is a consequence to living this bad behavior. It says that when everything had run out, the sun hit rock bottom. He found himself in a pig pen feeding pigs. And then he came to his senses. I pray today that no one watching online or no one in the room waits until they're at rock bottom before they come to their senses. It's not, it's not a good place to be. Waiting until you get to the bottom of the bottle to come to your senses is not a great place to be. 
Do you know what came to his senses, why he came to his senses? He's sitting there feeding a pig, wishing that he could just eat that food himself. And he realizes at a moment that he's feeding something that can never feed him. How many of us are feeding things that can never feed us? Feeding your addiction can never feed you. Come on, somebody. Feeding your anger can never feed you. Feeding your fears can never feed you. It can never feed you. And he's sitting here. My father has food for everyone and I'm sitting here. Because of my pride, because of my arrogance, because whatever. I need to go home. Hmm. It says that when the father saw him afar off, which means to me that although his father never actually went out looking for him, his father was always standing, watching, waiting. He always had an eye out looking to and fro, he'll come back, he'll come back, he'll come back, and when he does, I'll be ready, I'll be waiting, see, mm. as rehearsed as the son was for his repentance, the father was rehearsed for his celebration. The son created a story where he was willing to diminish his position from son to servant. And the father says, no, no, no. No, 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 no. Your position doesn't change. You, you, you don't get to change your position from son to servant. You are my son. You are my son. I've, I've been waiting for the day to see the shadow of your presence break the horizon. I've been waiting to see you walk down this very street and I've planned the day to celebrate you. Bring the robe, bring the ring, bring the scepter, bring the sandals, my son. You could never change your position of son. You're steeled. But we've listened for decades to the voice of the older brother, other discontent Christians in church. Well, how come, how come I've got to sacrifice and, and they get to go do whatever they want? Come on. Eyes on your own paper. Eyes on your own paper. Put your eyes on your paper. Worry about your test. Worry about your life. Come on. The father said to the older brother, ah, ill, ill. You could have had a party any day. You could have had a party any day. Your brother's back. Come celebrate. We need to see this today. God is forever looking for the lost, seeking and saving and bringing them close to him. And once you're in the family of God, there is nothing that can change that position. There's nothing that can change that position. Mm. But I love this turning point. I love this turning point. I love turning points in people's lives. And, and I'm hoping today there might be a turning point for someone in here today. When he came to his senses. You see, my, my, my daughter was totally fine, totally relaxed, full of happiness and being silly. Until she stepped out of the clothing rack and realized she was lost. She came to a moment of self-realization. I need help. I need help. I don't know where to go. I don't know where to go. I don't know where to look. Help! 
I'm going to ask you today, where do you find yourself? Maybe you're part of the 99. You are just, you're safe, you're sealed, you're secure with promise. You know that what your faith in Jesus Christ is, and you have eternal security in him, and, and you're just living a life. Man, I am so excited. That, that, is, that is the greatest place a believer could be. But there's others watching online and in the room who you identify with the prodigal son. You know you believe in Jesus, but you've wandered from the faith. The flame has gone out. David cried out to God. He says, return unto me the joy of my salvation. Renew a right spirit in me. He, he, he knew his position with God. He knew his covenant rights, but he was like, my spirit's wrong. I'm not, I'm not as excited about God. I, there's no joy in my salvation. I'm, I'm angry. I'm bitter. I have resentment. And maybe today you kind of need to change your focus. Get it back on what Hebrews tells us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So before we go any further, I want to take a moment. I want to pray for that, those first two groups of people. You're saved. You're sealed. You're secure. The first group, you live in the life. You're great. You're full of joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness. And then also, those who, they know they're saved, but right now you know you need to kind of hightail it back home. You need to get back in your word. You need to get back to a morning devotional time. You need to get back to a morning prayer time. You need to get back to maybe listening to some Christian music because you're growing dry. You're growing stale. Father, we thank you this morning for your children who were called by your name. We thank you for the relationship that we have in you, that you are close to us as the mention of your name. Lord, I pray for strength in the hearts and the lives of believers today, that they will not grow weary in well-doing, but, Father, they will continue steadfast in their faith and in their walk. Lord, for those that maybe uh, are just kind of wandering right now, they have found themselves kind of sliding back from the faith, Lord, I pray that you would renew a right spirit and return unto the joy of their salvation. Help them to take steps back home towards you. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Now there's that last group. There is, I'm not calling you a knuckleheaded sheep, but if the shoe fits, there's that group of people who you've been around church, but you've never become the church. You've been around the faith, but you've not had faith. You've been around believers, but you have not yet decided to believe. And the Bible says, today is the day of salvation. And, and I believe that, not that Jesus is leaving anybody now because we have the Holy Spirit, but today you're being called by name. A voice crying out through the wilderness to you. He says, if you would join me, I stand at the door and knock. If you would open the door, I would come in and I would be with you. If you're here today or you're watching online and you've never taken the time to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, we'd like to offer that to you today. And here, we, we, we want to encourage you and build you and, and, and give you uh, faith today. So we want to pray that prayer out loud with you. And it goes like this, dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time today, if you're watching 
online, would you do us a favor and, and type AMEN in all capital letters in one of the chat rooms? One of our online hosts would love to connect with you and mail out some information to you about your first seven days as a Christian. It's called Starting Point. It's a seven-day devotional that talks about each step of the way to get your relationship with Jesus Christ going in the right direction. If you're in the room today and you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you give me the honor to celebrate you for two seconds? Could you just wave at me real quick and say, hey, that was me. I prayed that for the first time today. Anybody at all here real quick? Anybody? I don't see any hands. We're good. Amen. All right. Congratulations to those who maybe said amen online. If you're here today and maybe you're talking to someone about your faith, and you would love to give them some materials. We have a little mini book called Welcome Home, and it talks about Christian faith, what we believe. We would love to give you a copy of that to take as a gift to sow into someone's life who you're ministering to. At the end of that book, it has a quick little prayer like we prayed right now, and they could start their walk with the Lord. If you're interested in that book, they are available at the Welcome Center. Just ask for the Welcome Home book. Amen? Father, we thank you for today, that your word will never return void, but it will accomplish exactly what you set it forth to do. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for being our comforter and our guide. We thank you for those lives that were changed from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of life. We thank you today, God, as we leave here, that everything we set our hands to would prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you. Offering baskets are at the door.